the TalkSport Fan Network. The ultimate on-demand destination for the UK's best fan-led football podcasts. Want authentic supporter insight on all things Bournemouth? Follow Up The Cherries in all departments on the TalkSport Fan Network. Club-dedicated content created by the fans for the fans. Search TalkSport Fan Network. Hello, Cherries fans, Leicester fans, Premier League fans, and everybody, thank you for joining us for this very, very special interview. Now, if you haven't already, hit the like, the subscribe, and the bell button below because it helps this channel to grow. Now, firstly, here's a bit about our sponsors, Dental on the Banks. find out more about them, visit dentalonthebanks.co.uk. Now, I do have a very, very special guest on this show. Now, this special guest is classed as a conspiracy theory by a lot of people. He did used to be a footballer. He played for Coventry City, Oxford United, Northampton Town and Hereford United. Of course, he is a Leicester fan, and he's somebody that you will have seen on numerous publications, numerous videos, and it is a pleasure to welcome on to Up the Cherries in all departments, David Ike. Welcome to the show, David. How are you doing? I'm good. Fantastic, fantastic, and thank you so much for joining us. So firstly, um, I wanted to speak about your footballing career. Um, how did your love for the beautiful game start? Well, you know, it was um, a, a, a big part of my, um, my, if you like, psychological development, because when I was a kid, I mean, you, you wouldn't know it now, but when I was a kid, I was born in 1952. <laughs> um, I was uh, very much lacking confidence and um, I was born in a, a real um, working class background in Leicester. Uh, we had no money, and I mean no money. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you kind of thought uh, that, uh, you know, y you were going to be like that all your life and nothing was going to happen and of uh, any uh, note. And, you know, you were, you were stuck with your lot. And uh, like I say, I... I was a very diffident kid uh, in the early years. And then one day um, I was, um, we used to uh, play at primary school. We used to play football in the playground. Mm -hmm. And we used to call it uppers and downers because the, the playground was on a slight incline and, and someone would come out at playtime, kick the ball, kick a ball in the air, one of those plastic balls, you know, that yeah. we used to have in those days. And, um, and they'd shout uppers and downers. And then you chose if you wanted to kick up or down. And, you know, the teams were often very uh, uneven. But I always wanted to go in goal, even though it was a hard playground. Like, um, I wanted to go in goal. I, I was kind of attracted to that. Uh, and I, I remember walking up the steps to um, this is in the would have been the third year of primary school. And uh, there was a note at the top of the steps as you went into the school. And it said, um, uh, trials for the school um, third year team, uh, put your name down if you want to be in the trial. 
And me of that time uh, thought, well, I'm not going to get in, am I? <laughs> What's the point? <laughs> so um, I'm uh, I'm going home one night, uh, maybe a day, a couple of days later, and I'm, I'm you know I'm walking quite a long way from the school, and now I heard this uh, th- this voice behind me shouting, "Ikey, Ikey, Ikey!" And I turn around. It was a, a mate of mine, and he said, um, "Mr. Rickard, the um, the the school uh, third year football um, teacher, yeah, wants you to take part in the trial tomorrow, right?" So I, I, I'm like, "Me? What?" Because he'd seen me playing in goal in the in the uppers and downers in the playground. So um, I ran home and uh, waited for my father to come back. And I told him, look, I've got a, I've done this trial tomorrow and I need some football boots. I never had any football boots. I never had anything. So uh, in, in those days, uh, it wasn't like you know, today where supermarkets were open till late at night. There were no supermarkets. <laughs> I saw the first one built in Leicester. Um, and um, so, uh, and, and there were really a, a lot of kind of shop laws and, things closed like Sunday nothing was open virtually and and it was um, after five o'clock uh, and all the shops were shut uh, and, and but anyway my father and me we, we went down to this row of shops in a place called Green Lane Road in Leicester and there was one shop open and uh, in in the, the center of the window was these pair of football boots um, and, uh, you know, uh, the boots they used to wear in the 1920s, actually make it 1910, yeah. you know, with a massive freaking toe caps on. And, and there were there were many sizes uh, bigger than my feet. They were adults. Right. But I mean, you know, beggars can't be choosers and all that. So um, we bought these boots for next to nothing. And I, I went and played in the trial. The next day and he wanted me in as a goalkeeper and uh he uh the, 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 this other goalkeeper was going to be uh picked and not me although very soon afterwards he played for the higher fourth year team so i i started my my goalkeeping career but right at the start um uh, in this trial uh, there were two of us and and mr rickard was going to decide who was going to be in the team by who had the hardest shot well, I mean, this poor kid uh, had no chance. I had these bloody big boots on with, <laughs> with, with, with toe caps. They, they were like they were like divers' boots, you know, <laughs> keep, keep you keep you underwater. So um, I hit this uh, thing with the end of my toe, and it, it went like an extra set uh, 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 past the goalkeeper. And so I got in the team, and I, I scored in my first game. Uh, we well, that that was not m- much of a feat because we won sixteen nil against a Roman Catholic school called the Newry. And uh, it's one of the one of the things I remember is um, I've never seen a football match where everyone but the goalkeeper, and I'm talking about the, the Newry team, everyone but the goalkeeper was everywhere the ball was. It was like it was like a swarm of wasps around the ball. The rest of the pitch from their point of view was it was empty. So we won 16 0. It weren't it, it weren't difficult. And then I got I I, I got into goal and um, that was the, what I really wanted to do, and I I, I was transformed as a as a as a as a, a, a kind of person really because suddenly I thought, hey, you know, you can do something. You know, it is possible to uh, to do more than um, th- than just what you thought you were going to do, and uh, I I became more and more confident as a as a as a kid. Um, thanks to football and thanks to goalkeeping because I was I was quite good at it and I decided at that moment when um, I was uh, in that third year football team at primary school that I was going to be a professional footballer so of course people laughed you know but I, I thought I am I am and uh, so I, I went to senior school and uh, played in the in the you know the school team uh, and uh, I was sent to some trials um, here and there for um, uh, Leicester schoolboys teams and, and didn't do a- any good. Um, and I got to, I would have been, what, 13. And I thought, you know, I've got to do something here because um, 
I, I'm not going to be a professional footballer the way things are going. And uh, I, there was this uh, amazing um, piece of luck that happened to me. I was sent to, to a, for a trial by the, the school teacher to, um, to have a trial for the Leicester under 14 schoolboys team. Now, this was the level where if you got in, the scouts were starting to look at you, you know, because if you couldn't, if you weren't in your schoolboy city team, then there's no point. I, mean, I understand that of, of, of scouts looking at you. So, but he said, there's a, there's a, a guy, because what was happening at this time is that the, there was a kid of my age who was playing in goal for the under 15 team. So it was taken as read that he would get in goal for the under 14 team. This bloke called Dave Valance, I remember. And so uh, the teacher said to me, well, I'm not going to send you as a goalkeeper because, um, you, know, you know, Dave Valance is going to get in. So I'll send you as an outfield player. And uh, so um, I played the first half an hour of the trial on, on the pitch and I was rubbish because my heart wasn't in it. I just didn't want to play outfield. Um, and so the uh, the guy who's running the trial said to me and two other kids, uh, OK, well, look, if we need you again, We'll, we'll, we'll shout for you. And you just take a ball and play on the other pitch. And, and you know, and, and of course, you, you knew at the time, it, you know, thanks, but no thanks. So we're kicking this ball around and I'm thinking, well, you know, how am I going to be a professional footballer? You know, and um, and then I heard this shout and it was the teacher. He said, hey, hey, any of you lads playing goal? And I, I'm off straight away towards him. Yeah, yeah me, I do. And what had happened is there were two goalkeepers, Dave Valance and another one, and the other one had got injured. <laughs> so I, um, I, I, I played in goal in, in the rest of the trial. And the guy came up to me afterwards, the manager, and he said, oh, I was very impressed. He said, um, uh, obviously, Dave Valance is going to be in the team, but we need a reserve, right? So w w would you come to the next trial? I thought, yeah, but I bloody will. So we had the next trial. And I don't know who picked the teams, but they were incredibly uneven. And I was on the end of a coconut shy. And um, uh, I only let one goal in. And on that day, if, if I had dived the wrong way, it would have hit me foot and gone over the bar. I mean, I, I couldn't not stop everything. I've never had a game like it in my life. And um, he said, well, look, um, you know, I thought Dave Valance was going to be in the team. But I, I, I've got to say, you were far the better goalkeeper in the trial. So you're going to be in the team. So I was in the under-14 team. And I started playing in under-14. And then an Arsenal scout saw me very, very early on when I played for the, that under-14 Leicester team. And uh, I, I went on trial to Arsenal. And uh, uh, and then a, another a, a series of other clubs came in for me. I got into the Leicester schoolboys uh, under-15 team the next year. I was playing for the Leicestershire County team. And uh, I had a, a stream of clubs. Funnily enough, a quick, um, a, a quick aside, when I was on trial at Arsenal, um, uh, I, um, one of, one of the times I went there, um, and, and stayed for a week, uh, with Arsenal was during the 1966 World Cup. And, uh, so I was, um, I was watching the World Cup and then on the Wednesday before the final, the, um, the England team came over the whole squad to, uh, the Arsenal training ground, um, uh, I think it's it's still there up in the, the Potter's Bar area. Um, and um, just Nissan huts in those days. It wasn't like, you know, base on Mars like it is now. And um, they were they played a, 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 a game against the Arsenal first team on the training ground pitch. London Colney, they called it. Um, uh, for all the players who, who weren't in the, the, the main World Cup team. And I remember standing next to uh, Jimmy Greaves uh, as he was he was putting his tie ups on his socks, and Jimmy Greaves had uh, been injured, if you remember, and Jeff Hurst came in, yeah. and uh, Greaves at this time didn't know he wasn't going to play in the final, um, but he he played in this in this practice game, and alongside me on the on the on the line as as we watched this game, what, what was the England World Cup team? Bobby Moore, Gordon Banks, and Gordon Banks, who I knew very well as a goalkeeper Leicester City of course that's how I learned to be a goalkeeper watching him and uh so uh and on all, on all the rest of the team it was it was phenomenal for a, what I was then um 13 uh years age of age 14 13 14 years of age um uh, but uh eventually I went to Coventry City 
um, because um, I uh, it was 25 miles down the road from Leicester and uh, that that that, you know, suited me. And, and also, you know, Coventry at that time were managed by Jimmy Hill and they, they got a hell of a lot of publicity because of Jimmy Hill. And uh, I, I signed for them um, just before they uh, got into what was then the first division, um, that now the Premiership, of course, uh, when they um, they won promotion from uh, Division Two, now the Championship. And I so I joined them in their first year in the um, in the in the top division, and uh, I didn't regret it because we had a fantastic time. You know, we got. Um, uh, one of the best youth teams in Britain. Uh, we got to the final of the FA Youth Cup, uh, played against Graham Souness when he was at Tottenham yeah. and Steve Perriman and all these people. Um, and um, yeah, I, I had a great time at Coventry. And then uh, I was... Uh, a strange thing happened just after I joined Coventry about six months in. Uh, it's a long story, but, um, you know, my left knee swelled up for no apparent reason. And uh, that was the start of arthritis. I didn't know at the time, rheumatoid arthritis. But I, I played for Coventry um, for um, two years as an apprentice professional and then signed professional. Um, and things were going really well, especially in the last season I was with them when we uh, got so close. We, we, we played Tottenham in the final of the FA Youth Cup. Um, big crowds were were watching us by then, and um, uh, we played four games before we we, we finally lost. Um, uh, you know, home and away, and then two two and a third game which was a draw, and then the, the third game at uh, White Hart Lane, which um, which they won one nil. And uh, so uh, by this time, um, by the next season, I spent a bit of time on loan at uh, Oxford United, who were in the. Uh, what is now the championship then that's when i met ron atkinson right atkinson was um was a club captain right uh he, he was a midfield player he, 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 as i remember ron he never left the the you know the the center circle he was just standing there and spraying it around but uh so i met him uh and uh i, I liked him he was a character and uh the, but the arthritis just started really uh, getting worse and it was in a few joints and um i left coventry thinking my career was over because that's what they told me don't play football again you could be in a wheelchair in your 30s mm -hmm. um and uh then i got a call another, another long story but i got a call from one of the the greats of um of football history in britain john charles who of course went to juventus and became the big gentle giant hero out in Italy. And he was managing Hereford United Football Club, which was um, a, a Southern League club at the time. And he asked if I'd go along and and, and play with them. Uh, and I thought, well, they train or play once midweek and um, then play on a Saturday. May I'll get up, maybe I'll get away with that. And uh, the next season, uh, we were in the league. Um, and uh, I played uh, 60 games uh, that season, first team games. Um, and uh, funnily enough, um, I, I still hold the record for the fewest goals conceded per game by any goalkeeper in Hereford United history. I, a, a guy on the local paper told me that um, when, he, when he interviewed me. And um, I, um, I also that season, we had a, we had a fantastic defence and, and got promotion. And uh, uh, I, I let fewer goals in um, in the season than any other goalkeeper except one guy called Stevenson at Burnley uh, that season. He, he let uh, one less in than me. Um, I think it was 22, 23 or something like that. Uh, and, and, but, but, uh, and things were going well. I mean, I know other clubs were sniffing around um higher up and i'm still i'm still only uh, 20 years of age um which uh, you know to be in a, a first team in a football league team at uh, 20 years of age in those days as a goalkeeper was a really big thing and I, i'm carrying this arthritis around with me um which the club didn't know about um otherwise that i got a new goalkeeper i guess but um eventually it got too bad and i couldn't i couldn't continue and uh and that was the end of my career when I was uh, I'd just turned 21. But, my, you know, my football career was was up to my 20th year. 
when you had to make that decision to hang up your boots or hang up your gloves in this case, um, how difficult was that, David? Well, um, I, I tell, I tell you a story of, of my my last year in uh, when I played league, league football that last year. Um, the arthritis had become so bad that um, every morning um, in the warm up. It, 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 imagine doing this now, but in those days, um, we used to train at Credden Hill, uh, Hereford, yeah. which is the base of, um, of, of uh, uh, you know, a major, major um, army base. And um, uh, what's the what's the what's that uh, regiment? Not the parachute regiment, the other one. The uh, the um, anyway, the, the, it's it's. Uh, a, a, Hereford is a famous base for this very elite regiment. Uh, and we used to train on their football pitches. They're great pitches and all that stuff. But I imagine that today. I mean, you, you couldn't. I mean, I remember uh, going back there through Hereford once, years and years later, and I stood out the fence just to have a look uh, at, you know, where we used to train. And within minutes, there was a an army truck turned up. Excuse me, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> and in those days, we used to train there every morning, you know. Uh, and it was, you know, cause during the winter months um, was uh, was wet and damp and cold. And uh, the warm up because of the arthritis was agony every day. <clears throat> I used to wake up in the morning. I know that with, within a couple of hours, I was going to be in agony for a, a, at least like 20 minutes. And then the, the, the joints would warm up and, and I'd get on with the training. Um, and, uh, so when, when that, um, when, when that's what you're doing every day, and of course during the games, the adrenaline got you through them. It never affected me in the games. It was weird, <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> you know, it wears you down, it wears you out really. Um, and what happened was, um, we won promotion, um, to what is now league two. Uh, <clears throat> which was fantastic in the first season, a bit like Wrexham did. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was um, it was in the summer between the seasons and I woke up one morning and uh, I couldn't move and I couldn't breathe. Um, and <clears throat> I was trying to knock my wife who was lying next to me, but I couldn't move. My whole body was frozen mm -hmm. and I couldn't breathe. <clears throat> so... I thought I was going to die. Uh, it seemed ages before I gasped a breath. It couldn't have been that long. Uh, but I gasped a breath eventually. And, and, and as I did, my body unfroze, but I was in absolute agony. It was like there was a knife going in every joint. Uh, and that was the end of my career. Uh, I went to bed a professional footballer and I, I woke up um, with no career. And so um, when you're in that kind of pain, and you've been in that kind of pain um, just to be a footballer for a whole season. Yeah. Uh, you, 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 you basically you have really had enough. Um, and it was sad because it's it's what I always wanted to do since uh, since I was a kid, like I say. Uh, but you 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 have to get on with it. You know, uh, you, you you can't feel sorry for yourself and be a victim. You, you have to say, okay, well that's that road is closed so what now and I'd always um as a kid I had a second bow of interest if you like beyond football and that was that was journalism newspapers and that sort of stuff I was reading newspapers when I was a kid um I wanted to know the latest thing what was going on and and I I, I remember you you'll remember these they don't have them anymore but uh they used to have the sports paper on a Saturday night Yes. Um, used to come out. They used to call it the pink or the the, the buff or whatever mm. the colour was. Um, and there was a, a, a bloke used to write the Leicester City um, uh, reports called Laurie Simpkin. Mm -hmm. And I used to read his stuff, you know, and I became very interested in, in, in how the whole thing was put together and, uh, you know, the, the how it was written and all that stuff. And years later, I ended up on the Leicester Mercury and my uh, my news editor was Laurie Simpkin, funnily enough. 
and, and so I decided when my football career ended that I I, I was going to go into journalism. And of course, uh, I left school at 15 to be a professional footballer. I never took a, a, a major exam in my life except, you know, end of year class exams. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to get into journalism and they're asking me, uh, you know, what university I went to. And I said, well, I played for Oxford United once. Does that, does that, <laughs> does that work? And uh, it was very difficult. But um, I had a, a friend who was a former Coventry director called um, uh, John Campkin. Well, he, he was a director when I played for the club and he's a nice guy who ran a, uh, uh, some um, travel agency business. And um, he, 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 uh, he, he contacted me when he heard my career was finished at Hereford United. He said, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to be a journalist. I said, but, you know, how do, how do you start? Because what actually happened, uh, you know, just going back one step, is when my career ended at Hereford United, <laughs> um, I was invited because it was, you know, uh, considered a news story. Um, to go to Central Television in Birmingham, which was Hereford was in the, that that region, uh, to be interviewed by a bloke called Gary Newbon, who um, became a, a well-known sports presenter, uh, live on the sh on the on the the evening kind of news show about how my career uh, finished. And funnily enough, next to me was um, a cricketer called Mike Hendricks, who became an England bowler. He was about to make his England debut. And so they did this thing on my career ended and his career with England cricket starting. Um, and I, I walked into the studio and I looked around. Um, this is just after my Hereford career is finished. Uh, and I thought, this is for me. Uh, there was a guy reading the news and everyone was going quiet just, you know, and stuff. And I, I thought, yeah, this is for me. And I, I afterwards in the green room, I remember saying to Newborn, how do you become a, how do you, be, how do you get into this business? And he said, well, usually do it by journalism. So I decided I was going to be a journalist. And uh, my goal um, from that moment in that studio was to front Grandstand, which was the, the big BBC Saturday yes. afternoon show where, where they're made famous by people like David Coleman and Frank mm -hmm. Boff and uh, later um, Desmond Lynham. <laughs> and um, I actually achieved that eventually. Um, and... Uh, that that was a, a a big moment not just because you're presenting a tv show but it was like you'd completed an ambition that started out when your football career had finished and so i went <clears throat> i went to um work on a weekly paper after i left hereford which was part of the leicester mercury group and it was just about read by the people who wrote it you know it was a it was a tax write-off um, and uh, it was the, the, the very lowest of the low in journalism. But then I worked my way up to work for the Leicester Mercury, and then I worked for BRNB Radio in Birmingham, which eventually got me into the BBC in Birmingham, which then got me into the BBC in London. So um, that, was, um, that was really um, how it all unfolded. Excellent. Well, one thing that I did notice as well, and I, I don't know how true this is, is that you went to Saudi Arabia to help their national team. Um, what did, what was that time like? Uh, nightmare. I only lasted eight weeks um, and I was starting to try to leave the moment I arrived. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in those days, um, I, was, um, I was working for BRNB in, in Birmingham. I didn't really know anything about Saudi Arabia. But again, John Campkin, same guy, um, contacted me and said that um, he was um, involved in a in a group led by Jimmy Hill mm -hmm. to uh, go to Saudi Arabia and try to sort their football out. Um, because in those days, um, of course, Saudi Arabian football uh, was appalling. I mean, it was appalling. And you, you had these uh, princes that um, kind of headed the different football clubs in Saudi Arabia. Um, and the, the quality was appalling. Uh, I mean, I, I, even with, you know, in those days, um, long after my football career ended, I played a few games in, in, in Saudi Arabia in their main, main stadium. And um, I, um, I, 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 let's say the quality was not a challenge to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so um, I went there and uh, I, I was uh, appalled by what I saw immediately. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, Saudi Arabia for me then and now is a fascist country. And I wanted to get out as quick as I could. 
um, um, which I did in, um, in, it took me eight weeks to, to uh, work it all through. But um, it was a great experience um, to see a country um, uh, uh, in which that level of control um, existed. It was, it was a real eye opener to me. Um, and the, 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 the royal family, not real royal at all, they make it up, the House of South, they had all these princes and they all kind of, um, you know, uh, hij have hijacked the, the oil revenues and everything. Um, but they were, uh, in those days, um, the reason they, had, they got this group in, led by Jimmy Hill, is that, that they were getting beaten. They, you know, they were seeing themselves, we're, we're the home of Mecca, we're the home of Islam and all these other Islamic countries. And, and, and the worst of all, you know, you have Sunni Islam and Shia Islam. Well, you know, the home of uh, uh, Sunni Islam is Saudi Arabia. The home of Shia Islam is Iran. <laughs> and so they were getting beaten by Iran. And uh, that, that was really at uh, football. And that was really, really not acceptable. So they, that's why they, they, put all, they put all this money into to, to building it up. And although I didn't stay very long, in a matter of weeks, um, I think the the Jimmy Hill um, group did improve football to the extent that it's gone on to be uh, much better than it was. But I do remember um, there was one game when um, uh, they're playing Iran <laughs> in a World Cup match in the main stadium in Riyadh. And uh, Iran absolutely played them off the park. They beat them 3-0. It could have been more, a lot more. Uh, and I remember going to the reception afterwards with all these bloody royals and, and what have you. And uh, to say they were pissed off is, <laughs> is the understatement of the century, uh, really. Um, and, um, I, you know, I, I, maybe Jim, Jimmy's group wouldn't have survived much longer after that. But um, they did. And I think they eventually did a, a work that, on which has been built um, – um, a much better setup there. Obviously, you can see the money they're putting in now with the um, with the Saudi League and Ronaldo and stuff. Of course, you eventually left the BBC. Um, if you don't mind me asking, David, what was that period like when you did leave the broadcaster? Well, the broadcaster left me. Um, it, it's a it's it's a it's a long story, and you know I won't bore you with it now, but. Um, Strange things were happening to me, uh, if you like, paranormal things, which I couldn't explain. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, in, in this same period where this was happening, and no one knew it was happening, only me, um, I, I got this, um, this letter from, um, from the BBC saying they weren't renewing my contract, which was uh, kind of strange because, you know, when, when I joined the BBC sports department eventually, um, in London, um, I, I, I joined it at the height of its powers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was presenting, uh, you know, shows, um, sports shows, um, uh, including some grandstands, which was the, my, you know, my ambition and sports nights and stuff like that, as they were then. Uh, and I was um, introducing and surrounded by some of the absolute greats of uh, sports commentary. Um, the team was extraordinary at the time. And many of them I'd watched on television, even as a kid. Mm -hmm. um, so I was um, uh, doing things into grandstand um, when it was presented by Frank Boff and when it was presented by David Coleman. I'm sitting there in the studio and these people who were, you know, um, heroes of mine from from way back when I was a kid uh, were, in, were were handing over to me. Uh, uh, you know, David Coleman and, and, and Frank Boff. We had Harry Carpenter doing the boxing. We had Peter O'Sullivan doing the, 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 the racing. We had Ron Pickering doing the the athletics. I mean, it was just an extraordinary. We had Richie Benno doing the cricket. Uh, and all these people I was handing over to, you know, when I was presenting shows, it was it was unbelievable to me because I was still young at the time. And, I, and, and, and you know, it would seem that I had um, a long career with them. I had commendations for my work and all that stuff. And then suddenly they decided they were not going to be renewing a contract. And uh, 
a lot of that, well, well the, the real reason for that was because um, I'd um, started to get very concerned about the environment, uh, not global warming, a uh, load of nonsense that is, but um, I mean, um, uh, caused by humans. I mean, um, the, you know, the environment in general, the pollution and the destruction of the beautiful areas, which was really going on big time at the time. But give this Labour government time and they'll, they'll outrun that, that's for sure. But um, the, um, the, 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 the point was I wanted to do something about it and eventually joined the Green Party um, and uh, became a national speaker for the Green Party in, in, a, in a matter of weeks. That's another bloody story. Talk about doors opening and doors closing. And, um, and in uh, 1989, um, out of the blue, well, it wasn't really out of the blue. There was a lot of environmental um, programs being made at the time. Um, we got this a big election result in the European elections of 1989, and suddenly the the Green Party is um, is is all over the media, and uh, that's when the the BBC decided that there was a, a conflict of interest between uh, the economic system is destroying the world, and Ian Rush scored two today, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so I, I was out of it, but I was I was glad really by then because. It's funny, um, once I achieved my ambition to, to front grandstand, um, I kind of lost that momentum. Uh, it was almost like it was achieving that ambition from the, the depths of your football career ending. Um, I, I'd, I'd lost the mom momentum, really, and I'd lost my... my, my, my my enthusiasm for being a television presenter. And uh, I went off on a, 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 another journey, which is still going on 35 years later. One thing I did want to get your thoughts on, um, because of course, Leicester City have been hit um, or were going to be hit because of profit and sustainability rules. Um, Everton and um, Nottingham Forest were hit last season. Villa are under scrutiny, as well as a number of other clubs. And finances are a big thing in football. And of course, uh, there's big changes in day-to-day -day life. Uh, cash is seeming to be phased out by the governments. I'd like to get your views on the financial system, both in football and in daily life, and who is controlling that? Well, Leicester, Leicester City got away with it, didn't they? Yeah, <laughs> um, no, I mean, I mean, I don't know what I'm delighted about that. Don't well, let's mess about. They got away with it. I don't know how, but obviously they got very good lawyers. But um, in in terms of uh, the the economic system, the economic system is, is a joke um, when you break it down. And I've gone into this in my books in 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 great detail and um, uh, and taken it apart. See, uh, it's all based on money that doesn't exist. Um, but you're paying interest on money that doesn't exist uh, and uh, to, to bankers who are lending you money that doesn't exist. Um, how, how do you mean, Dave? What are you talking about? Well, look, you go into a bank and you say borrow £50,000. The bank does not um, move any precious metals or move any tangible wealth around at all. It just types into your account fifty thousand um, pounds, and uh, that fifty thousand uh, pounds has not, does never, uh, and will never exist. Um, it's just figures on a screen. It's called credit. That's what credit is. It's money that doesn't exist. It's theoretical money, because um, you know, as I expose in my books, the same networks that. Um, control government, control the banking system. In fact, the banking system controls governments. Uh, it, it, that's the dynamic, really. And so laws have been passed which allow banks to lend um, many, many, many times uh, what they have on deposit. It's called fractional reserve lending. Mm -hmm. um, and so they can lend you money they don't actually have called credit. And the key thing then is they charge you interest on it. And um, so you're paying 
the principal plus the interest on theoretical money called credit. And, and what you have to do to get this credit is sign over tangible assets, your home, your land, your resources, your business, your possessions, whatever. And um, if you can't pay back um, the, the money plus the interest, often through no fault of your own, because the, the banking system and financial system has manipulated booms and busts and crashes um, for its own ends, um, then um, they get your tangible assets. And they get your tangible assets uh, in exchange for uh, non-existent theoretical money called credit. And there's another uh, point in all this. When you um, take out a loan, uh, say fifty thousand uh, pounds, that's what they create theoretically in the form of credit, fifty thousand pounds. But you're not paying back fifty thousand pounds. You're paying back fifty thousand pounds plus interest. The interest is never created in all these loans, and that means that at at any point there is never ever enough uh, money, theoretical uh, or otherwise, in circulation to pay back all the debt and all the interest on the debt that's outstanding around the world. Mm -hmm. And that means that uh, people losing their homes, their resources, their assets is built into the system. Now, when there's an expansion of what they call the money supply, more and more loans, in other words, are made by banks, um, that can be hidden to an extent. But when there's a, um, a... uh, a, a curtailment of the money supply by banks not making as many loans and calling in loans that are already out there, it becomes very, very clear. It's called a, a, bu- a bust or a crash or a credit crunch um, that there's not enough money in circulation to pay back all the interest and all the principal of the debt. And therefore, people lose their homes, they lose their businesses, they lose everything. And uh so the, the banking system is an organized crime. That's what it is. Uh, and uh, it's not called out because it controls governments. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. Why, why do governments, they're the government, why don't they issue their own currency interest-free? Why, why do they go to banking systems and borrow money on behalf of the public? Uh, what, what's the public sector borrowing requirement and all this stuff? What, what, why aren't you issuing your own currency interest-free and circulating it interest-free? Why are you going to banks and paying interest on it? In other words, the taxpayer is. Because the whole thing's stitched up. And, and you know, the, the, one of the greatest forms of mind control is familiarity. So you um, you become familiar with, with something. Oh, yeah, you want to borrow money, you borrow it from a bank and the government wants to borrow money, borrows it from the bank. Says, no one actually says, oh, hold on a minute. What, wh- why are they doing that? Uh, and, and these are the questions that I've been, uh, and many others uh, across the great spectrum of human life. It's the questions I've been asking the last 35 years, why? Why do you do that? Who says that? Who's controlling this? Who's decided that? And when you do, um, it's extraordinary how the whole um, system that people believe in just falls before your eyes because it's a nonsense. It's a confidence trick. Um, And, uh, you know, it's ridiculous, for instance, that the current Labour government of Keir Starmer can get 34 percent of the vote uh, in a democracy um, and and become an uh, an elected tyranny or a not elected tyranny in terms of democracy um uh, to 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 impose its will upon the population in the in the way that already is and we see nothing yet um from 34 percent of the vote is ridiculous and uh, but but oh yeah well that's how the system works well the system's nonsense then uh and and maybe we should find another way of doing it but familiarity is oh we've always done it like that it's like you know, kids going to school is familiar. Well, that's what you do. You go to school when you're young and all that stuff. And, and you know, no one seems to ask, well, what are the kids taught when, when they go to school? And 
how valid is what they're taught? What's the real evidence for it? Um, what is the, the, the supporting evidence for um, kids being told this is how it is and that's it, there's no need to question. And so all I've done for the last 35 years is ask these questions. And I tell you, 99% um, of the time, uh, the, the system is, is found wanting and has no answer. Um, but people have stopped asking questions, unfortunately, on the scale they need asking. Do you feel that there is, and you do mention control quite a bit, but do you feel that there is that control in football? Why PSR has come in is to stop Leicester doing what they did in 2015, 2016, win the Premier League, upsetting the status quo, um, and that the money and the profits from football will go to the big clubs which of course are funding the whole regime w would you say that that is the scenario that we're facing well funny enough years ago um i um you know would it be i don't know maybe 15 years ago i wrote a column for a, a football website every week um, i think it was called football 365 and, and my column was based on football as a microcosm of life mm -hmm. um and it is it's it's a microcosm of life in 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 this way just very quickly um you know my 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 son um uh, jamie uh was goalkeeper he had trials for manchester united in aston villa and he played in the portsmouth uh, youth setup for years um and um my other son um uh gareth he was the um england beach soccer goalkeeper for a number of years and football is a very great way well sport in general very great way but football in particular of developing your character and if you use it right and uh, creating emotional strength um, and uh, developing your character because um, you know you go through life and you have your emotional and uh, ups and downs and your challenges, you know, maybe every few days if you're unlucky or every few weeks or every few months or whatever. But in football, you can have those ups and downs literally in minutes. And and it's um, a, a great way to develop your character and get control of your emotions and, 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 and develop your personality. Uh, so it mirrors life, but in a very, very concentrated way uh, because of that. But... Um, in terms of the, the greater picture, uh, you know, when I was watching Leicester and Gordon Banks and Peter Shilton, who I actually played football against in schools football, known him for since I was about um, 14, 15, no, 13, 13, I played against him. Um, and, uh, y you know, the clubs were owned by the, the local business, uh, local businessman or something. Yeah. And, and there was a, um, a rapport between um, the club and the community. And also, although, you know, footballers, even in those days in the 1960s, were paid uh, more than the average wage. I mean, it wasn't phenomenally more. I mean, I remember Jimmy Hill again um, uh, fighting the case to bring in the or, or to end the maximum wage when uh, Johnny Haynes of Fulham in England became the first hundred pound a week footballer um but it's now gone absolutely uh insane i mean you know i like football but i mean 300 400 thousand pounds a week for kicking a bag of wind about i mean please you know uh, we've just taken the pensioners fuel allowance away for millions of them um so uh it's become much more um uh, apart from the community and it's um, it's gone from local business people running the club to um, these people that like in, uh, I mean, Newcastle United, you know, I played at Newcastle once. I mean, it, that, that was a fantastic experience. It's an amazing place. Uh, but um, they're owned by the Saudi Arabian government, in effect. I mean, what you're in the northeast of England, you're Geordies, 
and you're owned by the the Saudis. And, you know, it's like so many people. I saw this when, when Abramovich came into Chelsea and, and the, 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 the kind of background that he came from. And you you see the fans instead of the fans going, oh, hold on a minute. We don't want this Russian bloody oligarch um, running our football club or we don't want the Saudis running Newcastle United. It's like how much money are they going to bring so we'll be more successful? As if as if that's the only criteria. Um, and um, so I've seen this, this global um, elite, uh, this global financial elite, and, and elite in many other ways, elite in, in, in quotes, by the way, because they're not, they're the dregs, I think, um, who've taken football over. It, it it's it's now not i mean e even you know paying to uh watch the game is is no longer the prime criteria for financial income of of major football clubs they get it from other means and you know to a certain extent you know i remember when uh, i was going to what i was watching leicester city and and you know it was six shillings to get in the ground uh in the in the 1960s uh and and now it's a phenomenal amount of money to watch a game uh, and, and even that like i say is not the main income of the football clubs anymore the the major ones i mean it is lower down um and so obviously um the fans become less important they, 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 their importance starts moves from major financial crucial financial income of the big clubs to well, we want the ground for because that's better for television, if you like, better atmosphere and all that stuff, uh, because then money comes from elsewhere. And, and, and you know, when you've got these uh, these oligarchs in, in the Middle East and, and these um, these American owners and what have you, I mean, you know, you've got these football clubs now uh, who that were once, you know, part of the local community are now be, being owned by these billionaires from all over the world. And they've, they've become playthings or e even, um, you know, financial uh, asset investments. And uh, I, I don't like the way it's gone at all. But it, the football, going back to that column I used to write, football ha has just mirrored the system in general. If you look at um, a, a, a few multi, multi, multi billionaires, I mean, billionaires like hundreds of billions, um, and, and you add up their um, assets, uh, it, it's equivalent. There's not that many of them before you get to this point. Their assets are, are, are um, more than half the world's population. So uh, for football to go the same way is, um, is just, you know, par for the course, if you like. And they've moved in on that. And I don't think that's right. I don't think that's at all good i'm sure the, i'm sure the players love it with the, the incomes they get at the top level but um i i think it's um it, it's ve very um um it's very much the wrong direction that football's gone um as a game and of course this uh effort to bring about this european league mm -hmm. for the elite um is all part of the progression because if you look at the way the world has gone, um, there was a time when um, we were organized in tribal systems, humans. And then there was this pivotal point where lots of tribes were brought together under what were called countries. Now a few people at the center of the country were dictating to all the former tribes that formed that country. This happened all over the world. And then you took the next level where, um, you know, the European Union is, um, is a classic example, where you bring loads and loads of countries together and you centrally dictate them. And where this is planned to go, is what I've been writing about for years, is the next level where you have a world government which dictates to everybody uh, on the planet from a central point. And, and if you look at football, it's mirrored that. Fewer and fewer people. Um, are now able to, to own football clubs because of the, the financial implications of doing that. And, and you know, you're right. I mean, Leicester City's um, winning of the premiership 
was a um a phenomenal kind of um thing to do um in the sense of the the financial disparities it was just amazing it was like everything it was a perfect storm uh, of a nice kind that that came together with the players and the way they played and 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 what happened that season but you you look at it now you look at you look at you know clubs like bournemouth um you um i mean how, how is anyone ever going to do that uh, given the, the the financial situation that um, that the, uh, of the demand that, that's demanded now, so you've got clubs like Leicester City. You know they 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 get you know players, they develop players, they make players um, uh, valuable, and then they sell them to clubs that have the financial resources to buy them. Same with Bournemouth, of course, classic. Um, and and uh, so um, it's um, it's a uh, it, it's it's a, a direction that that's uh, very dangerous for the smaller clubs. And you know, uh, I'm a, a, a bit of a supporter now <laughs> of Burn Albion because um, you know that the, if you go into the Championship, I love I love the Championship. I mean, even the upper level of the Championship is you know financially kind of massive the, with the, some of the clubs but you go into the championship that that's the old first division that i remember that's the that was what it was like and you you, you know you go to clubs like burton albion they're, they're community clubs they're, they're still they're still retaining that uh interaction with the fans uh, they're not like in the stratosphere and the fans are down here so um you know i i like lower lower league football because um it, it I, I i just think it's it's it, it's more like it was certainly more like that I, that that I remember. And once you get to your Manchester Cities and your Manchester Uniteds, I mean, Manchester United owned by uh, the Glazers um, out of America, uh, and and you've got the Manchester City owned by you know again um, the Middle East oil oligarchs, and it's um, it, it's not the the the, the, the what I remember. Um, but having said that. Um, there are, you know, there are some very good things about um, modern football, um, and one of them is the pitches. <laughs> I remember when, when, when I played football, professional football, um, it was on a ploughed field from about late October, November onwards. Manchester United, you look at some of the the, the pitches that uh, that were at Old Trafford uh, during the winter that George Best and Bobby Charlton played on. You look at uh, Chelsea and all these clubs, uh, Derby County under Brian Clough. I mean, I played at, uh, at Derby County under Brian Clough at the baseball ground, and there was a few blades of grass in each corner, and that was it. Um, uh, so they're now playing on billiard tables, and and the, the, the football benefits from from that, I think, you know, definitely. And my, my, my other uh, thing um, about modern football, my gripe, is the bloody goalkeeper's gloves, by the way. Okay. Um, I, I was working on a program called Newsnight for the BBC when I was doing, um, uh, you know, news journalism before I went into sport to, um, uh, full time. And um, I was doing this uh, film on Bristol City. They were in financial trouble at the time. And uh, I, I was it was would have been what? I don't know. In the, in the 70s, would it be in the 70s? Yeah, late, late 70s. And um uh, I, I'm, I'm, they're training and I saw these gloves, right, just lying there. And I thought, what are they like? And I, I put the gloves on and I picked a ball up that was lying next to them. And, and it was it was more difficult to drop it. These latex gloves, you know, and, and of course, they, they they have such soft latex uh, in the in the in the league football that they only wear the gloves once, certainly at the top level they do, because uh, it's, it's such a fantastic grip. And uh, we used to wear like string gloves and you, you, you used to um, uh, have to give with the ball so you could hold it because, the, the, you know, the, 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 there wasn't this stickiness of latex rubber. Uh, and, you, you, and, and the other thing about uh, goalkeeping in those days is you were expected to catch the ball when you could catch it. <laughs> yeah. And, and what I'm seeing is all these goalkeepers pushing the ball away now. I, I, I guess the ball moves more now. I guess that's the reason they do it. But. 
Um, and, and, you know, players put more on the ball than they, they did in my day. I, I remember um, when I was starting out in football and, and quite a bit afterwards, that when someone got the ball on the, on the, um, on the touchline, like a winger or something, you went to the back post because you knew that's where they were going to put it. And they used to loft it to the back post. And then um, uh, Ron Greenwood at um, West Ham brought in the near post header, the near post cross. Uh, Martin Peters bringing it in to uh, often Jeff Hurst at the near post. And now suddenly everyone was doing it and you couldn't go to the back post anymore. You had to readjust in, you know, in, in, if, in case it went to the near post. And the game changed because they, they can do a lot more with the ball now. I think the, the, the balls and the pitches have, um, have made that possible as well as, you know, um, uh, better coaching maybe. But um, it's a different game now uh, for a goalkeeper. And um, uh, I'm not sure I would have enjoyed it as much as I did. It's quite interesting what you did mention as well uh, during that segment, because there's a lot of Bournemouth fans who feel that they're losing their club. And of course it was a community club it was always fighting su for survival it was always on its ass put nicely david of course it's now been bought out firstly from maxim Demin, um the russian owner who was fantastic yeah. and now bill foley who is an american owner and they feel that that is slipping away do you feel that that the top end of football is just going to be consolidated with these clubs. And say, for example, a team like Burton Albion, do you think it's ever possible for them to do what Bournemouth have done? Uh, Burton, no, because they don't get the crowd potential. Um, I mean, you you get what, what what's um, the Vitality Stadium hold now? 11,000? 11,000, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't think Burton Albion would ever get that. But um but, you know, for, for Bournemouth, I've got great admiration for Bournemouth. You know, when, when Jay, Jamie, my son, was playing for Portsmouth, we used to go over to uh, I'd, probably not the training ground now, but it was the training ground then, Bournemouth, uh, to play Bournemouth. Uh, it was near Hearn Airport. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, so uh, I've got a great admiration for Bournemouth and in, in, in the, the way that they have managed to um, – consolidate um in the in the top division given the eleven thousand income uh from the from the gate uh it's 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 great and leicester city to an extent uh, i know they had that fantastic season in the premiership when they won it but um Le leicester city for a lot of their history um since the 60s uh, would have been uh, in division 1a you know what i mean they've just gone between the two and a lot of clubs do because it's very difficult to sustain um, the, uh, the 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 income disparities to to stay in the Premiership. Um, but um, I can completely understand why Bournemouth fans think they're losing their club because everyone's losing their club once they they get to those levels where global oligarchs move in, um, and you see you you've got the. The, the guy who's bought Bournemouth, but does he have any allegiance to Bournemouth? Uh, has, had he heard of the place before the, you know, the possibility came up? Uh, it's uh, uh, these, I mean, what, what, what does the Saudi Royal family know about Newcastle? You know, they, they, they are assets to acquire and for uh, often they are playthings to, um, to own uh, and they lose that, um, uh, that um, interaction with the fans, that that allegiance with the fans. They might talk about it, but they don't really have it. And, you know, to an extent, um, um, the owners of Leicester City uh, have shown themselves, uh, especially uh, the gentleman who unfortunately died in the helicopter crash, they uh, they showed themselves to 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 have that rapport with the fans. They did they did have that rapport with the fans, and the, the fans loved them. Um, so it is possible, but at largely it doesn't happen. David, honestly, this has been an absolute pleasure to have you on this show. Um, before I let you go, do tell us where anybody wanting to find out more about your philosophies and your beliefs can find you. Yeah, davidike.com. 
um, I, I, I had to I had to really laugh. Um, I, I I was on on a website and <laughs> it was a website talking about old Coventry City players. Where are they now? <laughs> and um, I found my name, and it said um, basically went a bit strange and now is living out his life quietly on the Isle of Wight. Well, the last thing I'm living my life out is freaking quietly. <laughs> but, um, so uh, they, they did, I, I did let them know that, and they've, they've changed it. But, um, yeah, it's davidike.com, and uh, we've got a, a media platform uh, too. We, uh, it's a kind of a, an alternative to, to, to Netflix. In When I say alternative, I mean alternative information and views of the world. Um, called Iconic, um, I-C-K-E, uh, no, I-C-K, uh, Conic. Um, and, um, and so that's, that's there as well. And I've just got a new book out called The Reveal, which is, uh, as deep in the rabbit hole as I've ever gone. So, um, check that out if you, um, if you want to, um, see what I'm talking about. David, honestly, it has been an absolute pleasure and thank you so, so much for joining us today. Pleasure, yeah. And, um, you know, well, let, let's hope for a draw, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> Keep it balanced. Well, no, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, mate. Bye. Take care. And thank you, everybody, for joining us on this show. Again, hit the like, subscribe, and the bell button below. It helps this channel to grow, and it is free. So thank you so much if you've done that already. We hope that you really enjoyed the interview. Do check out all of our other interviews as well on this show. We've had Tom Meehan from Consabian. He, of course, is also a Leicester fan. We've had Tiff Nadell, of course, former of, formerly of Top Gear. We've had Omid Jalili, of course, the comedian. And we've also had lots of special guests across music. We've had the likes of Peter Hooten from The Farm, Richie Neville from Five, Damon Minchella from Ocean Colour Scene, Richard Archer from Hard Fi, Adam Devlin from The Blue Tones, Gaz Whelan from The Happy Mondays, and there is lots more coming as well. So please, please do check it out. Thank you again for joining us on this incredibly special show. And we'll see you in the next one. The TalkSport Fan Network. The ultimate on-demand destination for the UK's best fan-led football podcasts. Want authentic supporter insight on all things Bournemouth? Follow Up The Cherries in all departments on the TalkSport Fan Network. Club-dedicated content created by the fans for the fans. Search TalkSport Fan Network. <laughs>